Uh, I'm honored and humbled to open this uh, series of discussions that we are going to have over two days, today and tomorrow morning, under the general label Armenian Identities. Uh, This is not the first time we discuss. We don't have any microphone. We do, we do. This... No, no, no. There... No, no, it works, I guess. Yeah, it works, it works, it works. It is streaming, it's okay. Don't worry about the technicalities, there are people who take care of them. Uh, we started six years ago, to almost to the day, with a very important conference, the Armenian Genocide. History, memory, responsibility, which brought people from several countries to discuss the uh, uh, most tragic problem of uh, Armenian history, the 1955 uh, 15 uh, genocide. And we continued with local forces, also in the same series, Ideas in the Agora, with a discussion again on the Armenian genocide and its memory with a writer and uh, um, essayist, Pedro Sorasanjan. Today, uh, we start this discussion about Armenian identities, homelands, and diasporas. And uh, over uh, these panels, you will get closer to the uh, substance of what we need to discuss. I was actually asked by somebody uh, in a short interview, what did I think about Armenian identity? That what I think about Armenian identity is very well captured in the title of the conference, Armenian Identities. Just as I believe that there are Romanian identities, more than one. Fluid, interactive, ever-changing, historically situated, spatially, temporally determined, but this doesn't mean that all these Armenian identities lack a number of principles and factors of cohesion, of communication, of dialogue, of interaction. And it is those elements that we are after. Uh, they are not definitely an essentialist definition of just one uh, fixed Armenian identity, but they are to be found precisely in the historical uh, development of all these uh, identities, extremely diverse, sometimes hard to reconcile, even irreconcilable, uh, without a center, like all identities are. So in a way, my, uh, uh, my approach to this, as I will uh, uh, elaborate on in my own intervention, uh, is based on the very simple idea that one, in order to understand uh, the extreme mobile, uh, intricate complexity of a cluster of identities, especially in the case of a very, very, very long history, which is the case with uh, the history of the Armenians, one really has to struggle to get to a number of uh, commonalities, a number of uh, uh, ideas that will keep us busy here. <clears throat> now, first of all, uh, we are honored to have with us His Holiness Datev Hagopian, the Bishop of the Armenian Church of Romania, I will kindly invite here to speak. So please come with us. He will address us in Armenian. And uh, our friend, Senator Boskadian, is going to do the, the translation. Barun Tespan, Harkarjan, Antamner, Nerganer. Your Excellency, dear friends, uh, all of you who uh, find yourself here with us. 
Voskanen, Ev Rumania, as Mutian, or as PC, Ye Baron Sorin, Antohim, or as PC, Karebor, Tasahosagan, Shark Magaz Magelben. First of all, uh, I, I want to express my gratitude to the Union of Armenians uh, of Romania and to the historian and professor Sorin Antohi for having the initiative to organize this workshop. Ima Haigagan in Knutian Harsnester. Mesam. Mes Hamar Amena Garevor Harsne. I saw Hars with Dank Nach Mekmezi. Betke Menk Hai Manak Tevoch. So uh, we discussed today about the uh, Armenian identity. Uh, for now, it's maybe the main issue. And the question is could you remain, could we remain Armenian or not? Hamash Harain as charge Ashari as Sorba Garkimej. Anshush mes bedu tuner mes jovurtner biduzen bor pokrama su tuner gorsvi nirens lezunal gorsvi. In this uh, worldwide evolution existing now, it's similar to what uh, our bishop said. So, so in the in this worldwide evolution, the the, the great uh, political powers they try to destroy. It. The small countries and the minorities for disappear. If as Haigagan in Knutun Shat Mets Hantirmane, Voebe Amen, Pilisopagan Harsmane, Asvaza Panagan Harsmane, Amen Jugeru Mech, Amen Vok Garzevor Hai Manalo Hamar, Betke Hiren Hosil, Masmagase, Betke Hai Meshagut Bail, Mengseng, Yegeretzi Betke Kak, Uremen Darper. So maybe, maybe uh, uh, because uh, the title is Armenian Identities, maybe it's not wrong, it's adequate, because you know uh, there is a huge debate about Armenian identity. They say, for example, that Armenian identity means uh, uh, keep the practice of the language. Others said uh, uh, you have to uh, have the knowledge of the culture and of the traditions. Other, uh, others say that uh, you have to be a practitioner in religion. If you ask me, I mean, you ask oh, him, yes. for example, uh, he thinks uh, that uh, the, the Armenian religion and the knowledge and the practice and, the, and, uh, and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, attachment for, for uh, uh, Armenian religion is a, is a key problem. Yes, Gagarzem Haigagan in Knutun Bailu, Amena Garevor Jampan, Habakagan, his show with Tune, Hajo Urta, Uni Habakagan, his show with Tushad Garevor Parmagasem, Habakagan, his show. I think a mere Jorti, Hin Badmutuna Bahel. So, uh, uh, my personal opinion now is that uh, the Armenian identity has to be focused on tradition or our Armenian patrimony, or our uh, uh, cultural uh, wealth. Ureman Haiga Ninklutun Bailu Amar Shad Garevor Nev Haigagan Avantutunere Yevsovorutunere. And for the Armenian identity, it's very important to keep uh, the tradition, the Armenian's habitudes. Yevanor Amar Menkepor Anshus Bidisek Hokeboragan Guzeink Bashpane Geretsin, Boryes Gesem Yegeresomech. Yepor Mart Hai Martu Kai Gereci, Gereci Mejka Lezu, Mishaguit, Hai Gagani Shogutunga, and there are many inch Havakvaze, Evanoramar, Roman Haitunga, Hai Manats, Borovedev, Gabaz Manats, Hai Gereci. You could say because uh, I represent the Armenian Church uh, that uh, I have uh, this uh, special approach. But I have to confess that if somebody, an Armenian, goes to the church, uh, he find their language, tradition, culture, and don't forget that if we speak now Armenian in Romania, if we have here an Armenian community, it's due to the Armenian Church. It's very interesting that after a tradition of thousand years, Armenians in Romania they remained Armenians, uh, and uh, this is uh, 
because of the role of the church. Anora Maria's Gagarzen were as hard as Shatgare, Vore of Meng Betke, Iscabes, Meng Usum Nasireng, Vorovedev, Haigan, Niknutun, Mesiamar Shatgare, Vore, Vormeng Garonank, Mera Bakan Gerdenk, Yev Meng Menang as Ashari, Kardezi Vra, Yev Jo Wurtnerumech. And uh, uh, for us uh, uh, to discuss about Armenian uh, identity, to have an approach about assumed Armenian identity, it's important not only because the Armenian identity is focused on the past, but because in the same time is the base, the ground for the future. We should have our MCS have the Martem for Iskabes Menk. I saw as Yergore Runtaskin, Karen Meziamar, Garebor Tassera, Yev Menk Spirki Mech, Gerdenk Mer Haigagan Abakan, Yevus Hazard Dari. I, 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 uh, express again my gratitude. I wish you a successful uh, workshop and I hope to have here a harvest uh, for our future and uh, I wish the Armenian uh, community of Romania another thousand years. Yes, Romanian Egadze, Romanian Spirki Amar, Amena Avor example, ne Orinagne. And uh, maybe Romania uh, with uh, taking into account. Uh, uh, the, the attitude about minorities is maybe the best example. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, offered to us uh, a rendezvous for another thousand years. Yes. Yes, Armenian history is, in fact, about thousands of years, not about decades, not about uh, centuries. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, thousands of years go by, but there are moments when uh, history gets out of its ordinary ways, or my ordinary words, maybe even goes back to its ordinary ways and gets into tragic conundrums, into tragedies, into violence, into situations that are almost uh, uh, impossible to understand and are downright inhuman. This is the context we, we witness uh, these very days uh, in various places uh, around the world. And one of those places is, of course, uh, Armenia itself, with the evolution, recent evolutions in the Artsakh. I was watching in uh, uh, dismay uh, various reports on various media, uh, international media in several languages of all kinds of uh, continents and so forth, trying to see comparatively as it were and in sync and in uh, uh, what was going on, what people were thinking about uh, all those developments. But I can just tell you one thing as I shared with my wife first at the time and with friends, that uh, the, the Western media seemed a lot more preoccupied and in fact by and moved by uh, the fate of uh, the Hartzog pets. They were uh, simply disheartened to see that cats and dogs had been left behind by the Armenian refugees. And I was even uh, uh, discussing this with my wife saying this, oh, uh, too bad there is no international tribunal for uh, animal rights because otherwise uh, they would have gone after these refugees. There was so little compassion uh, uh, around the world for this tragedy unfolding under our very eyes. And so, uh, uh, and such a belated uh, and in fact too, too little, too late uh, uh, reactions on the part of uh, European Union uh, institutions of all sorts, and uh, that I am, I cannot uh, go further. I will uh, invite uh, His Excellency, Mr. Sergei Minasian, the Ambassador of Armenia to Romania, to address it. Thank you very much. Yeah representative and leadership of Armenian community of Romania, our compatriots, dear guests, distinguished scholars and speakers. 
First of all, I would like to thank organizers for the invitation to come with a short introductory remark on this conference entitled Armenian Identities, Homelands and Diaspora. I would like to thank organizers, of course, for this great idea of conducting of this important conference, as well as thanks our distinguished speakers and scholars for taking part in this important event here in Romania. I also want to thank all of you for being present here, dear members of our community, scholars, our friends from Romania, and I hope you are looking forward to the discussion, discussion as much as I'm doing. This is not the first time that we are discussing the importance of the maintenance of the Armenian identity that remains one of the most important issues for Armenia and the Armenian diaspora, as well as to define the obstacles that we should consider as challenges and opportunities we should overcome altogether in this very complicated for all of us times. Today, we have to look to the future through the lens of our millennial history and recent development in our region and in various parts of the global world. As we come together today with the theme of Armenian identities, homelands and diasporas, I would like to mention that the issue of the maintenance of Armenian identity was always one of the most important issues for Armenian studies and Armenology, both in Armenia and abroad, especially in the countries like Romania, when traces of an Armenian presence more than a thousand years old. The developments that both Armenia and the Armenian diaspora have faced in recent years, including also war and ethnic cleansing lately carried out by Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, raise new challenges and concerns for the academic community as well. The organization of similar events is more than important nowadays in the sense that Azerbaijan, after ethnic cleansing of the Armenian population from Nagorno-Karabakh, initiated also attempts to rewrite the history and to annihilate or imbibe Armenian historical, cultural, and religious heritage. In this regard, now more than ever, the Armenian studies are important to present to the international community on the academic and scientific basis both the rich historical heritage of the Armenian people, as well as to present the dangers of the physical destruction of Armenians and their historical heritage as a result of ongoing genocide, ethnic cleansing, wars and violence carried out by Azerbaijan with the direct support of the third actors. It is also not a secret that in the background of all this development, a serious gap is occurring in communication and interaction between Armenia and Armenian the uh, diaspora communities, and also even between inside of different Armenian communities and structures. This process is also visible in the practical sphere between political, religious, society structures of Armenia and diaspora due the growing social, political, and even ideological differences regarding their visions and prospects of the future of Armenia and diaspora. But we should also do, should understand that there is a big difference of this issue during this last 30 years because the Armenian state already occurred. And we should also realize that no one, no one political, uh, social, or religious organization could change, replace, or substitute Armenian state's place in this complicated issue. Unfortunately, we also should realize that this division is also observed in the academic circles dealing with armenological issues and Armenian studies. From this point of view, it is extremely important for me as a former academician and as Armenian ambassador to organize and to participate in similar events where discussing the Armenian identity, the connection between the diaspora and the motherland, the historical past and future perspective, together we can find answers to many questions to create new ideas and to form a common approach to all challenges and threats that Armenia and Armenian diaspora are going to be faced now and in the future. Once again, dear organizers, I would like to thank you for this remarkable conference and wish every success to participants. Thank you very much. And it is that very much our turn now. <coughs> uh, we, there will be two uh, presentations, uh, one by 
myself and the other one by Abedis Hajjian. Uh, before we go to the, those, let's say, presentations, I'm going to ask Varujan Poskanyan to give him, uh, give us the, his uh, uh, original My opening word. address. He, <laughs> he doubled as a translator and I lost him in translation. It will be original, you'll see. So first of all, I, uh, I welcome all our guests and uh, I express my gratitude to Sorin. Uh, and uh, some, a few words about the Armenian community in Romania. Uh, if you take into account uh, the continuous existence of communities, you have to know that the Armenian community in Romania is the oldest in Europe. Armenians went to Venice or to Marseille before, in the 6th or 7th century. But if you take into account the existence of a community, the Armenian community in Romania is the oldest one, with a tradition of around 800, 900 centuries. Armenians founded cities in Romania. They uh, were here and they developed a community life before the existence of the Romanian states. <coughs> you could find churches from 14th century, 15th century. We have here two monasteries and we have a city named Suchava. I can say that it's something like the Vatican uh, of, uh, of Armenians in Europe. Of, uh, if you may, uh, uh, if you let me say like that, the Echmiadzin of Europe with four, four churches and two monasteries. So, uh, uh, I was invited in 2018 in Los Angeles and London to discuss about Armenian identity. And I remember my speeches there about genocide, about tradition, about motherland, about Harabakh, and so on and so on. I think we can't discuss now in the same terms like five years ago. We don't discuss now about Armenian ideology, but we have to discuss about Armenian surviving. Of course, there are a lot of identities. There are a lot of Armenian evolutions and branches in the history, but there is only one motherland. Without motherland, our discussions will be sterile, like, for example, the parliament of Gotha, which in 1848, when the revolution started in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they voted laws. And my personal opinion that uh, is that uh, we, uh, we have to discuss not only in terms uh, of uh, traditions of patrimony, very important, but we have to discuss in terms of uh, defense capacity, in terms of weapons, in terms uh, of uh, evolution of our capacity to defend our country. We don't have now only a motherland. We have in the same time a mother sky. And because we evoked only the motherland and uh, uh, we neglected the mother sky, the danger came from the sky. And we lost 5,000 square kilometers, maybe the hard core of the Armenian civilization, which is Artsakh. I have some figures. For you. Because if you, we don't take into account this priority of the short-run uh, horizon, we'll copy the history of my grandparents. They uh, uh, listened in Giligia and uh, uh, the Leaman uh, uh, and the Grung, and they cried. Will you repeat the same experience? I think uh, it's enough. Uh, enough, it's enough. We were, we were very happy in the 90s with Armenia, with Karabakh, with two independent in entities. And we have to keep now the state of, of America, or United States. He said that the south of Armenia is in danger. 
because of the pan-Turkish ideology who want to unify Azerbaijan and Turkey crossing the Armenian territory. In the last years, Azerbaijan had a very huge development. I have some figures, and this is the reason why I said my, my presentation will be a little bit different. Look here. In 2021, the GDP of Azerbaijan was $55 billion. In 2022, 78. And 2033, the forecast is 112 billion. So in two years, they will double the GDP. This year, the income from oil and gas is more than 30 billion dollars. And we know that is uh, this is not only the oil and gas of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is used for the oil and gas of Russia to go to Soviet uh, to, to the European Union. And this increase of the GDP is associated with a very with a stronger position of Azerbaijan versus European Union. Azerbaijan now is a strategic partner of European Union. This is the reason why Azerbaijan attacked Armenia because uh, Armenia, Karabakh, because they know that everything uh, is permitted to them. Now about the uh, the defense uh, expenditures. The defense expenditure in the last three years doubled in Azerbaijan. Now Armenia. The GDP of Armenia is now around 20 million billion dollars. And it's very strange that in 2019, 2020, 2021, the military expenditures not only decreased in per a percent as, as GDP percentage, but they decreased in nominal terms. You can imagine. During the, 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 the 44 days war and the year after, the expenditures in military of Armenia decreased. Only last year, uh, the, 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 the military budget increased uh, to 700 million dollars. If you compare with the budget of Azerbaijan, it's one to five. Of course, we can't uh, uh, compare with Israel. Uh, which dedicate to army $24 billion every year. And maybe the main difference between Armenia and Israel is that Israel doesn't have its neighbor Russia. If in their neighborhood was Russia, maybe Israel could have the destiny of Armenia. Uh, which, is, which is my point. Armenia has to dedicate more and more, more attention more resources, more modernization to the capacity to defend the territory. Because the position of our countries is in that way that in our neighborhood we have Turkey, we have Russia, we can't trust Russia, and Iran. And the position of Iran uh, is very, very, very much oscillating because Iran has interest in Israel, and maybe Israel could, uh, could play a, di a different uh, game uh, if you take into account the interest of Armenia. This is the reason why we need to develop ourselves, our own capacity. We neglect it completely, and the result was that Azerbaijan entered and occupied Karabakh in four hours without any victim. They came in holidays in Karabakh. If they knew that there is a danger for them. If uh, they knew that they will let victims in Karabakh, maybe they thought twice. So this is our main point. We have to associate to our usual discussion about identity, the discussion about survival.
If not, I say, Gerung, Im Gilihia, and uh, and uh, other songs will cry, and we dream to another independent uh, country. We need Armenia because, despite uh, the the capacity of Armenia to spread over all uh, uh, world in all worldwide planet, we have only one root, and to have we have to preserve it, to to defend. And unfortunately, it's only the language of weapons now. There is no any other mother tongue. There is not a mother tongue. It's a war tongue, and we have now the bad experience in this year. Thank you very much. Jean Bosganian, thank you very much. He reminded us all the things that we should not, I mean, in order to keep our object of uh, academic curiosity on the table, we need to keep Armenia alive. Uh, and that's, uh, in fact, the emergency. Uh, when I started out <coughs> uh, my own uh, studies in Armenian identity many years ago, I did so because of a family connection that I treasured a lot, which was the connection between my mother and her family and the group of uh, the Armenian community living in the city I was born, the Wokna. And I uh, developed very early a kind of familiarity with things Armenian to the point of never considering Armenians <coughs> real strangers or foreigners in any significant ways. Uh, as I sometimes say, uh, my paternal grandfather, who was a, a reader, an avid reader of the Bible, uh, was not really preoccupied with the fine distinctions between uh, uh, various forms of Christianity, but rather was focused on the unity of uh, all forms of Christianity. Thus, the Armenian, uh, Romanian uh, <coughs> differences in this respect are not his main uh, object of attention. But I uh, made my own Armenian friends growing up, uh, irrespective of uh, an ethnic uh, principle of sorts, but rather going with my own life and my own uh, interests that were intellectual, uh, musical, political, uh, and so on. But then I started to uh, ask myself the questions that I was asking myself in connection to Romanian, to the Romanian identity or to Romanian identities. And I thought that there was no better tribute uh, to, on my part, to the Armenians than uh, a rigorous study of, uh, let's say, the hardcore of the traditions about uh, Armenian identities uh, of all sorts. And in so doing, I was trying to do, uh, uh, to engage in an exercise which I engaged in for my own uh, 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 ethnicity or ethnic identity uh, for many years. And I'll, I'll give you just the, a brief outline of what I'm interested in and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> In books published in Romania and France uh, over more than 50 years, Sioran, Sioran constructs in his own fragmentary, obsessive, and apophatic manner an extreme metaphysical definition of Romanian ethnicity. The most succinct version of this negative hermeneutic of Romanianness is the question. Comment peut-on être Romain? How can one be Romanian? Which was formulated as such in his book of 1956, La Tentation d'exister, The Temptation to Exist. It is Sierra's adaptation of Comment peut-on être person? The question addressed by the world of Enlightenment Parisian Salon to an Oriental traveler the noble Rika, fictional hero of Montesquieu's Lettre Persane. 
in Montesquieu's book, the question signals a superficial, arrogant, and essentially ridiculous refusal of alterity. A closing of the mind by absolutizing the chance norms of a local culture which perceives itself and imposes itself on others as universal. Choran took it from there. I have extended his approach to other cultures, <coughs> repeating this question, comment peut-être intéressant, to the cultures I knew best, and that, of course, started with uh, the Romanian culture. Uh, and I was approaching other cultures through the analysis of ethnic stigma, a negative self uh, identity that is very common, the excess of collective self-criticism that has accompanied radical nationalisms everywhere as a negative self-destructive counterpoint. Uh, I touched upon this in my uh, speech last year, almost to the day when I was honored to receive uh, the Gheorghe Asaki Prize of the Union of Armenians of Romania in the Yash. Uh, and I expanded it a little bit in a uh, text that was published by Ararat in Romanian. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but I look through this lens at Armenians, following them from their homelands to their adoptive lands, and trying to make room in my own theory of ethnic ontology, which is the, the name I give uh, to the metaphysical form of radical nationalism. And in fact, I am challenged in my own theory by the existence of a phenomenon that in the Romanian case is only very recent, and I would add devoid of a spiritual foundation or support, which is the Romanian <clears throat> diasporic condition. I'm interested in uh, uh, the uh, Armenian diasporic condition in ways that could possibly enlighten me about the future of the Romanian diasporic condition, but the next of kin in each of my uh, studies is always the Jewish diasporic condition, for reasons that I will, uh, of course, surmise that I can uh, uh, not get into this. Uh, now, I will uh, say something about ethnic stigma first, as this negative version of radical identity. Uh, I started to develop this theory in the footsteps of Sioran, who was only talking about uh, radicalizing the, the question, comment peut romain, and I expanding into uh, a theory of uh, collective stigma, which is a lot con in many ways connected to the classic uh, theory of uh, uh, 60 years ago of Irving Goffman in his splendid book, uh, Stigma on the Management of Spoiled Identity. But of course, going from there, I was looking through uh, uh, um, developments in the cultures I was familiar was, uh, with, especially in uh, the case of Romania, in the case of uh, Germany, which is probably the epitome of that, because it is also the culture that has given the highest form of metaphysical identity, which one finds in Heidegger, of course, and which was emulated by absolutely everybody in Central and Eastern Europe and elsewhere, whenever discussing whatever it takes to have a metaphysical identity, whatever it takes for a nation to have something irreducibly one's its own, that is something that is utterly metaphysical, where it is changeless, is not affected by history, it, was, it isn't affected by anything, it is there supreme uh, as a form, even in, in, in this negative form. And going from there, I developed a theory which I call ethnic ontology, in which, keep in mind Heidegger, uh, 
usually philosophers, poets, philosophers. Romanians, of course, are aware of uh, the work of people such as Lucian Blaga, or from among philosophers, Mircea Vulcanescu, <clears throat> of course, uh, and uh, most recently and most, let's say, uh, uh, well, at a great, a greater length, uh, Constantin Noika. Uh, these are people who are trying to give their uh, nation, their ethnic nation, something which was a metaphysical foundation. Interestingly, since the, uh, now the Orthodox Church in Romania is not going to like this, but or Orthodox believers are not going to love this very much, but I have to say that the presence of the Orthodox Church in Romania has been a lot more recent, a lot less uh, obvious, had a lot less impact, has a much weaker uh, written and documented tradition than the, tra than the tradition of the Armenian Church in Romania let alone the Armenian church worldwide. Right? So uh, in terms of the documents available for analysis, uh, in such situations, uh, it turns out uh, there is this immediate temptation to come up for the missing parts of the national Vulgate, of the national saga, of the national mythology, with a brand new uh, mythology that tends to avoid any uh, facts or any forms of historicity and simply rises up straight to the transcendental levels where we are not talking about territory but we are talking about space. We are not talking about history but we are rather talking about time. We are not talking about language per se, but rather we're talking about the logos, the perfect language, the, the ethno-national language as the perfect language. Uh, we are not talking about uh, the historical uh, unfolding of various identities and collective uh, forms of aggregation of the various uh, 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 sections of the uh, ethnic uh, Romanian uh, nation, but rather we are talking in terms, again, once again, in metaphysical terms, uh, we are talking about being uh, Dasein. Uh, this is something that, mind you, depends very, very heavily on the fixation of, a, of an ethnic group in one space. It, you cannot do this with mobile uh, uh, groups of people. So one has to even ask this question. How long does it take for an ethnic group to develop a local or a new or an improved ethnic ontology? How long does it take for people to, let's say, changing from deserts to mountains to take these new forms of spatiality into account, mythicize them, uh, turn them into metaphysical dimensions of, of that. And that is a, a very interesting question for, uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, this uh, uh, system I'm, I'm trying to uh, put together, which is the ethnic ontology. Hence my, my interest uh, not only emotional and, uh, you know, uh, um, yes, sentimental for the Armenian uh, story writ large, because this was a, a combination of original motherland or motherlands, areas of the motherland, fragments of it, a constellation of motherlands or of fragments thereof, a constellation, sometimes uh, uh, floating in an ocean of adversity and foreign uh, uh, populations, empires of all sorts, 
being destroyed, devastated, decimated, uh, annihilated. And that uh, development from this archipelago of points of origin to a much wider archipelago of diasporic locations, where simultaneously, also historically, but also simultaneously and discontinuously in fragmented, sometimes counterintuitive ways, the saga of Armenian identities goes on. Uh, inscribed in uh, host countries, host cultures, host languages, host everything, trying to stay in touch with whatever there is out there from uh, history, from mythology to history, to from legend to truth. And uh, I am, uh, I continue to be fascinated by, by this uh, extraordinary capacity of uh, <clears throat> Armenian scholars of many generations of taking up uh, all these issues, especially because they have to deal with a gigantic written corpus with a gigantic text that is there. In principle, this leaves very little for invention because everything is written down carefully by generation after generation after generation. The dialectal and the you know, variations and all these things are really uh, trivial if you, uh, if you look at the whole picture as I tend to, to do as an outsider. As an outsider, I see, uh, uh, well, as an outsider visiting the Matenadaran, right? I'm, I'm visiting it uh, as a complete uh, uh, ignorant, of course, looking into the uh, various shelves of, of, of this, not only in the permanent exhibition, and seeing, for instance, uh, being shown graciously by the director, the first translation of Euclid's Elements, uh, into Armenian in a beautiful, neatly separated uh, Greek-Armenian uh, text with splendid uh, figures that I would like to uh, reproduce by hand. Uh, and now, this extraordinary richness and diversity, in principle, could be enough, but would be very difficult to synthesize in a central narrative that would accompany, let's say, at least the first steps that one takes in becoming Armenian. Because, of course, uh, uh, one, in all this story of uh, identities, one thing that is usually underplayed is that one becomes Armenian every day. Why not? where one uh, stops being Armenian every day with a bit and another bit. These are mobile, unstable identities. And this is, in fact, uh, what people should remember in times like these, when the very uh, foundations of the uh, motherland are under serious threat under the indifferent eyes of the free world, by the way, as I mentioned. Uh, and in fact, my, uh, in my dialogue with uh, Armenian friends in academia who work on matters like this of Armenian identity, I have to say that not naively, but uh, seriously, I take the side of those who want to keep up some of the traditions that otherwise would be completely underwritten and forgotten. I just make a short break here to greet my old friend, uh, one of the most uh, uh, extraordinary historians of religions of all time, Giovanni Casadio, who is with us for a while. He shares uh, our passion for Armenian history and uh, Giovanni, grazie.
Grazie, arrivederci. Eh? He is on his way. He is on his way to the, to the airport, but he wanted to be here and in in the beginning. Uh, uh, thanks to him, uh, news about this colloquium have spread uh, uh, in the fields of uh, history of religions worldwide. So I'm grateful to him for this. So this is pretty much what I wanted to give you a, a kind of sketch of my first my initial uh, uh, infatuation with matters Armenian, and then the persistent interest I found in dealing with these uh, uh, difficult uh, theoretical and comparative issues uh, in my modest uh, uh, work over the years. Now, uh, we move to the uh, <coughs> last presentation of this evening, and we turn to Avedis Hadjian. Avedis is uh, no... Uh, uh, stranger here in Bucharest, and I'm very glad that he's again here with us. Uh, well, he was born in Aleppo uh, in uh, in the past, in 1968, I have to be precise. Uh, he is a writer and a journalist. I would have to say that he uh, worked everywhere as an editorial writer for La Presa in Buenos Aires, and in the United States for CNN, Bloomberg News, The Wall Street Journal. He published in the biggest uh, places, Los Angeles Times, International Science Moni uh, Business Times, uh, Le Monde Diplomatique, the Christian Science Monitor, Hyperallergic, which is a blog that I would uh, recommend to my best friends, which is a very, oh. very active and interesting place to, to check out. Uh, he studied uh, journalism in Buenos Aires, and of course he is a graduate of Cambridge University with a degree in international relations. Uh, his book on the Armenians uh, who still live in the geography of the genocide uh, in occupied Western Armenia and Cilicia, Secret Nation, the Hidden Armenians of Turkey, was actually discussed here in a separate event at the Armenian Culture Center. And with this, welcome back, please. Thank you. His Grace, Excellencies, dear friends, I'm humble and honored to be here. Um, the hospitality and the friendliness of the Armenian community of Romania um, um, simply defeats my powers of expression. Um, so I'll, without further ado, I'll start my talk um, with a quote by the father of Armenian history, Moses Korenazi. Tebedivem kadzu pokr yev tevov huzhun poku sahmanyal yev zorutyam tgar yev untailov which means, for although we are a small nation and we are very limited in number and deprived of power and have been conquered by other nations many times, still in our country there have been many feats of courage worthy of being immortalized in writing. It is recurring. It is a recurring quote in Armenian literature and lore, as 15 centuries after Moses Horenazi, the father of Armenian history, wrote it. It still holds true to the letter. In this presentation, I'll try to explore possible causes for why we have stayed a small nation after millennia of existence. Uh, far <laughs> from being comprehensive, it is just the first approach to the problem. Uh, we are faced uh, with the demographic crisis in Armenia. If current trends hold, Armenia's population is expected to shrink to 2.6 million by 2050, according to the UN Population Fund. Armenia also has an aging demographic, with people of, um, of ages 63 and up, constituting about 15% of the country's permanent population, of 2.9 million in 2021. Let us also reflect of the, on the impact of the genocide, successive extermination campaigns and massacres, the most recent of which we just witnessed only weeks ago with the, the forcible displacement of the entire population <laughs> of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh. And make no mistake, the fact that most of them escaped alive uh, doesn't mean that it was not what that doesn't mean that what happened was not genocide. It was genocide by other means, and that's another discussion. Um, but let's make a comparison with the European case. 
about the impact um, massacres and genocides have. After the First World War, the annual number of births in France, which before the conflict broke, uh, broke out in 1914, had a population of 40 million, half to 400,000 a year from 800,000. The statistical models project that because of the war, and when we are talking about the First World War and its impact on France, more than one million missing children were never born. If we consider that at the time, 1915, 1914, 1918, in short, the early 1920s, large families were common in the Armenian territories that bore the brunt of the genocide of 1915, with households of 10 or more children not being uncommon, which is still not uncommon in the, the now Kurdified geography of the genocide, where um, families of um, households of 10 or more children are fairly common, even in cities like um, the Kranagert or the Arbekir under the Turkish occupation name or elsewhere, projections can be made about the missing growth of the Armenian population. How many children, in other words, were not born because people were simply killed? Uh, um, this can be um, mathematically modeled and calculated. I just mention it here because war has always offered cover for Turkey and Azerbaijan's genocidal plans. The 44-day war of 2020, in which Armenia lost an estimated 5,000 young men, has a larger demographic impact than their own deaths if we make the projections about birth loss. Again, potential births that did not happen and I am not ready to dismiss that calculation from the war plans by Turkey and Azerbaijan, which are foundationally and fundamentally not only genocidal states, but collectively genocidal societies in behavior and outlook, shaped by these courses of hatred that permeate every level of public life, from the government to schools and media. Uh, to understand the impact of the casualty toll of the 2020 war for a population of almost 3 million like Armenians, it is the equivalent of half a million people in the United States in 44 days with a population of 300 million. You can just imagine the outcry in the media if that were the case. Yet, let us take a look at the map. Okay, <coughs> first take a look on that. Yes, one second, I'm trying, trying to open a different map here, uh, which is what happens, well, well, Microsoft has a way of, okay, um, downloads. Give me one second. I just want to show on the map if it ever have opens. Oh. If I may, you you ask about the impact of the democratic uh, the uh, demographics. demographics. Yes. If you, if you take into account that in Anatolia lived three million Armenians, and half of them were killed. Exactly. And uh, the survivors now, they are around uh, seven to eight million. Yes. It means that the number of victims now is equivalent to the survivors. It means seven to eight million people. It's possible that in the world of death, was born a boy with the same name. You see, because half of us were killed, we are like Archie born. Half of them is living here on Earth, and half of us under them. This is the reason why we ask the recognition of the genocide. Because it's impossible for us to be uh, entirely without the support of all the humankind. So this is a real impact. Half of us are living, half of us are dead. Exactly. 
Thank you. Um, um, well, the map is a bit fuzzy here. Sorry about that. But uh, if you can make that out, the Armenia Moses Forensi was talking about as being a little small nation. It's you can see it here. It may not look too big on the map compared to the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire, but if you judge it by size, it's the third largest state by area in the known world at the time. So that's what we did Pokhara uh, do. Just compare that to the uh, fraction that's left now in Armenia, which is why it has stayed relevant. But he was talking about a completely different Armenia, his, his benchmark, where the Byzant, uh, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, not the small Azu, uh, poker Azu that we know now, is, which is actually a really small uh, country. Um, so, um, it, it, um, it, and this Armenia that shows there, it's uh, the hike, the Armenia prior to its first partition in the fourth century between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empires. But it was still a big country. It was the equivalent uh, to, to, in, to, to make rough comparisons to what France would be now in the international system. It may not be one of the largest powers or superpowers, but it's a country of relevance and impact. Why then, since Horinati wrote his history 1,500 years ago, have we remained a small nation? It is as if his phrase had prefigured the destiny of the Armenians. We will try here to test um, the underlying concepts against some of the evidence we have collected. And as I said, this is just an initial and first approach to the topic. At the time Horinati wrote his history of the Armenians, Armenia had underwent its first partition, the one I mentioned in 382, I believe, between uh, the Roman and Persian empires, and was on its way to becoming a buffer state or region. The geopolitical role it has preserved to this date since it resumed life as a political entity or state, even before recovering independence. For it could be argued that following the Turpenchai Treaty of 1828, by which um, what is now the modern Republic of Armenia passed under Russian control, um, that has been the function of Armenia in, in regional and, and especially Russian geopolitics. It's a double-edged blessing in the sense that one way or the other, it has justified the existence of Armenia with at least one major power invested in it, uh, which is now up in the air, as um, Mr. Boskanian just said. Yet at the same time, it has exposed it to all the drawbacks of buffer states um, at the fourth line of empires, whereby they often become their battlefields as well, which has been the case often in Armenian history. This is consequential in our days as the world is going through a vast traumatic transformation of the post-war order, in no small part as a delayed effect of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, which was a catastrophe, and I'm saying here this, not as imperialist nostalgists would mean it, but in the sense that it was an, intended, an unintended consequence of processes, economic collapse, separatism, ideological bankruptcy, uh, and we could go on and on about the causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but that could not be controlled. That was not, to put it shortly, the Soviet collapse did not happen because Gorbachev or the, or the Kremlin wanted it. It was the equivalent, so to put it, of a geopolitical train wreck. We may now, as we speak, be only a few catastrophic events away from the current conflicts that are raging in our part of the world, and I'm including here the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or latent at the gates of Europe, from becoming regional, which could in turn push the domino pieces into becoming an unstoppable, larger, possibly global conflagration. Um, let me be clear, any large conflict in which Israel is a player will inevitably involve, one way or the other, the United States, and if said conflict draws in Iran, Armenia's currently strategically most crucial neighbor at this point in history, you may draw your own conclusions. In a letter from prison in 1929, Italian Marxist intellectual 
Antonio Gramsci foresaw the catastrophe awaiting the world and Europe um, in a prescient line, which has been reinterpreted by Slovenian um, philosopher Slavoj Žižek in 2014. Gramsci said in this rephrased, um, um, in, the, in this rephrased uh, statement that, um, by Žižek, the old world is dying and the new one struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. This period in which the status quo and accepted or tacit rules that govern relations in international polity are rapidly being appended is a window of opportunity for the said monsters, for the Erdogans and Aliyevs of this world, which is why they are in a hurry to attain their maximalist goals. We do not know what kind of world is going to emerge from the ruins of the collapsing one. The, and I'm talking about the world born in Yalta in 1945, the post-war uh, order, or if you want the world that um, re-emerged um, after the Soviet collapse, but we can be more or less confident that big countries or territorial dimension will matter more to cope with challenges that go from geopolitical instability and firepower enhanced by technology Again, as Mr. Woskanian reminded us, the danger posed by um, drones to climate change, which in extreme cases can challenge the viability of states, especially if it impacts access to water resources. In other words, this period is more complex for small countries like Armenia. Now, um, um, in an ideal world, depending on other variables as well, the small territory and population are not necessarily bad things. You know, um, just um, think of Luxembourg versus India or China. I'm not, I'm not talking about the resurgent India or China of today, but the way they were in the 1950s with famine lurking around the corner and driven by a range of social and political tensions, which to this day are still there in both India and China. But as Nassim Taleb has said, to illustrate um, that these are not comparable quantities or qualities for that matter, an elephant is not a large mouse. We are talking, in keeping with the metaphor, about different beasts. There are different animals. I mean, China is one thing, Armenia with its size, a different thing. With, with, without geopolitical um, conditioning and, and challenges. This is to say that the dimensions of Armenian territory and population at this junction in history of world critical import, perhaps more than ever in Armenia, uh, that after at least four partitions, the loss of the kingdom of Cilicia, followed by six centuries of statelessness, is now a fraction, as I said before, of what it was historically. In no small part, the shrinking size of the Armenian population may be a reflection of the constraints to integrate non-Armenians who historically inhabited Armenia or Armenian majority territories. This is an issue little explored with, with little sources available. So that's why I'm sorry for insisting this is just an initial approximation. But it was not always so. Um, Armenians were, had the ability to integrate non-Armenian communities into the mainstream. There is some evidence that Jews settled in pre-Christian Armenia and became pagans, al Armenian, beheld to Armenian divinities, some later converting to Christianity. Um, a scholar, Jacob Neusner, has explored this issue in his paper, The Jews in Pagan Armenia. And we're talking about pre-Christian Armenia. But even more importantly, Parthian nobility, Bartemnera, uh, was Armenized. Indeed, it was Parthians, let us name key ones, St. Gregory the Illuminator, Subsag Bartev, it's there in the name, King Ramshabu, who cast the mold, in a way, of what we know as the modern Armenian identity. Now, if this is the case, and, and if the premises we, we were putting forward here are true, why have we lost this ability to absorb others and enrich our nation? Um, um, uh, an inability that apparently has accompanied us or that, that seems to have extinguished among Armenians in the sixth century under Domini uh, of the Christian era. One explanation may be the weakening and gradual loss of statehood with the fragmentation of Armenia. Integrating people of diverse backgrounds into the majority population is a function of size. 
The bigger and wealthier the host country, the more powerful the aspirational lure of integrating into the host society by people of different stock, and the more numerous are the channels to enable them to mingle, if that were a desirable thing for them. We're talking, of course, of more or less free societies, and I'm not talking here about the um, somehow compulsory nature um, of um, assimilation in, 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 in the type of autocratic countries like Turkey or China. Um, yet there are other more subtle factors at play as well that may explain this progressive inability of the Armenian um, nation to integrate communities of a different background into the mainstream until at least the emergence of the Republic of Armenia in its three iterations. We're talking here about the first Republic of 1918-20, the Soviet period, and the current Third Republic. Um, it might be speculated that three key events in the fifth century, which was critical in Armenian history, cast um, in the fifth century of the Christian era, obviously, cast the mold of the modern Armenian identity as we know it today. The creation of the unique alphabet that put an end to the Greek and Assyrian competition um, to influence and win over the Armenian church in an already partitioned Ike that helped preserve the Armenian identity, consolidated it. The other two intertwined events are, of course, the Battle of Avarij, with which the Iranian efforts to convert Armenians to Mazdaism came to an end, and the Christian imprint of the Armenian nation was reaffirmed. But at the same time, uh, Avarai uh, prevented Armenian participation from the Council of Chalcedon and the eventual rejection of its premises, uh, on its precepts. Uh, at the time, Armenians you know, were resisting the Persian attack, uh, and the Armenian church um, in, um, eventually became an autocephalous national church. What's interesting about these intertwined two events um, the Avarair battle and, and Chalcedon, or, or, or the Armenian absence thereof, is that on the one hand, we pushed back against the Persians, and by, reject, by rejecting the, the thesis of Chalcedon, of the, of the uh, Council of Chalcedon, we also rejected the Greeks. We rejected the, the, the Roman, Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire. So we, we, we said no to both, to the, to the ruling powers of today. Um, so if we, if we describe an arc from the extreme opposite case of the Comaginian kingdom, which was ruled by a dynasty that claimed Armenian descent, and which in any case was inhabited by a majority of Armenians, the Comaginian kingdom roughly corresponds to uh, Poker Hike or, the, um, or what is now the, 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 the Turkish, uh, the, the Armenian occupied regions of, of um, Malatya and Adiyaman, um, well, the king of, of, of the Comaginian kingdom described himself as Philo Romaios Philhelen, friend of the Romans, friend of the Greek, conscious of the delicate balance of power he had to strike as a buffer state along the Euphrates and military routes, which afforded him to uh, some power of arbitration. Um, but after, after, after the fifth century, after Avaraid, after rejecting the Council of Chalcedon, we ended up being, if we may be forgiven for a brief poetic license, Ostis Romanorum, Ostis Hellenes, Ostis Persarum, anti Roman, anti Greek, anti Persian. Um, and this is obviously an exaggeration. Um, Armenologist Nina Garsoyan has reflected on Armenians becoming more Europhile by the way of Christianity and distancing themselves from the Persians, in a way becoming distinct as the region was changing around them. And only a few centuries, um, only a few centuries later, it, 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 it transformed dramatically with the advent of Islam and the Arab invasions, with all the ills they brought to our part of the world. Again, for, for want of a better expression, in a way we were becoming strangers in our own lands. We were becoming very different from what was around us. Yet the Armenian pushback against the efforts to Persianize or Iranize their homeland is understandable. Let me quote Cyril Tumanov on pre-Islamic Persia. Cyril Tumanov was a great scholar in Boston, I believe, in Harvard, of remote Armenian ancestry. Uh, he was more Georgianized, uh, his family anyway. So he says, 
the Iranian empire, like all non-Christian communities, was by its nature committed to societal monism. This form of mind admits but one society of which the temporal and the spiritual are merely two aspects and which the former is the molder and the raison d'etre of the later, of the latter. The natural tendency of a, mon of a monistic society is towards absolutism and beyond towards such exaggerations as the fusion of the spiritual and the temporal and the idolization of the state. And here he is talking about pre-Islamic Iran. He's talking about the Iran of the fourth century. Let me remark also that these lines by Tumanov were written in 1954, a full quarter of a century before the Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979, which could be pretty much described in the same way. Following the partitions and the recurrent instances of disintegration of Armenian statehood, including King Senekarim relinquishing the, the, the kingdom of Basburagan and the Byzantine Empire for Sebastia in the, in the 11th century, we could probably say with some confidence that the single most powerful unifying factor or institution of the Armenian nation was the Apostolic Church. But that was probably so already by the 8th century. And the Church, as the mediator of Christ on earth, has a set of defined canonical parameters that do not necessarily or always correspond with the resources or vehicles of integration at the disposal of the states. Thus, we may suggest that the idea of Armenia or Armenianness, Hayutun, develops into a mostly ethno-religious exclusive nationalism. If this assumption is true, it follows that such a society would have less elasticity to absorb into the tissue of Armenian nationhood cells or groups that are at variance with the mainstream. We therefore see um, different groups that start pulling apart, splitting from the body of the Armenian nation over time. The Chalcedonian Armenians, many of whom eventually become known as forums among Armenians, pockets of whom still exist to the best of my knowledge in Thessaloniki. Uh, they are Armenians who joined the Greek Orthodox Church. Curiously enough, I talked about this in April here, but I'll make a very brief mention. I found Armenian Islamicized Armenian horums in, 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 in the Pontic region of what is now Turkey, who were still um, were identified by Armenians, if not by themselves, by their own neighbors. And I found out about them because uh, another very strange group uh, the, the, the Armenian Roma, the Gypsy Armenians, which are not truly ethnically Armenian, uh, worked with them, and one of them had seen them crying that the Herant Dink, the Armenian journalist, was more murdered in the street of Constantinople in 2007. So they still felt, after so many um, um, divisions and so many traumatic events, so many conversions of identity over 15 centuries, they still felt some attachment to their original identity. Um, so the Horons, then we have the famous case of the Pavlikian, the Paulicians, part of whom may have eventually become Muslims. Um, they were a heresy, an Armenian Catholic, so one is the third Odznetsi, uh, or John of Odzun or Odzun, as he's known in, in non-Armenian literature. In, and we're talking about 8th century, 70, 717 and 728, condemned them as iconoclasts. They were later um, more relentlessly persecuted by Grigor Magistros in the 11th century. Even though he is less remembered than other figures of Armenian history, Catholicos Hovannes Oznetsi, the one I mentioned before, Catholicos uh, Hovannes Yerort, was instrumental in shaping modern Armenian identity by unifying um, liturgical practice across Armenia, which was a vast landmass, as you can see there, um, it was under his leadership that the Armenian church became, we can say, the representative of the Armenian people before the Arab Caliphate, who the then occupiers of Armenia. Edward Gibbon, uh, the British historian, mentions the Paulicians as implacable fighters led by someone called Carbeis, Carbeas is written in, 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 in Latin characters, whom, whom Gibbon describes as a 
valiant coalition whose forces joined the Saracens, that's the Muslims, the invading Muslims, in fighting Rome. The father of Carbes had been impaled by Catholic inquisitors, and if not religion, filial revenge would explain his hostility to the empire. He founded the fortified city of Tepris around 850 um, of the Christian era, which is still occupied, and I'm quoting here, Gibbon, by a fierce licentious people, and the neighboring hills were covered with the Paulician fugitives, who now reconciled the use of the Bible and the sword. Tefris is now what the Turkish occupiers call Divri, a little town in the province of Sebastia. And I met a person in, in, in 1913 who claimed to be a descendant of Paulicians. Armenians apparently are still known as Paulicians, Pavluklar in Turkish or in Kurmanje, uh, in the Kurdish or, Kurm or dialect spoken in the nearby town of Zara where this person I called Nikos in my book hailed from. And I'm going to read a verse um, from a song that they sing in their, in, in, in their little town. The gelsen de dayan, çifte çifte, pavluklar dönerdi, şişeler kurulup, bade sunardı. This is in, 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 Tur in Turkish. The, pa the Paulicians burned, you hung in there too. The Paulicians returned in pairs, they arranged the bottles to offer love embodied in wine, or they offered almonds, which is pretty much the same, apparently, in poetical, um, in a poetical metaphor here. What is interesting here is that Armenians are generally still referred to by locals as Paulicians, even in these obscure verses from the 1920s, um, and which cryptically refer to the genocide, the burning, the wine. The wine is often an identificatory element um, in, in Muslim countries and in Turkey, which are um, at least um, canonically, according to a religion, deprived of the joys of drinking. Um, even in lines that do not make a lot of sense, perhaps to disguise or to obscure uncomfortable truths about the topic that is still taboo in the perpetrating country. This person, Nigoz, which is a pseudonym, had an epiphany when he was 19, some 30 or 35 years ago, and decided to convert to Christianity. He became a Catholic. Um, to his surprise, his nominally Alevi or Kizilbash family, the Kizilbash are a, are a branch of the Alevis, which are not Muslim, and that's another discussion for some other time, did not, did not oppose his decision, and he was surprised, even though only one uncle attended his baptism at the, at the, at the ruins of an Armenian church near Ankara. Um, uh, this uncle who came to his baptism told him, I understand why you are doing this. He didn't understand. It was only then that he learned from this uncle of his that uh, his family alleged to have Polishian or Armenian ancestry. It is now practically impossible to prove or establish that they are indeed of Polishian descent, the descendants of these people who fought in the fortress of Tefris uh, with, uh, near, near Zara. Um, but um, what, what I want to reflect on here is the enduring quality of, 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 of identity, even after millennia. Um, even though there is a mention of Paulicians still being around um, in, in Bahar Shabbat in the early 20th century. Also left out of the Armenian mainstream were the Tondrakians in the 11th century. This was a group of rebels um, uh, who took part in uprisings in the 11th century uh, when um, peasant uprisings were common in, 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 in Armenia. We also left out were the Islamicized Armenians in Fatimid Egypt, who may have numbered in the tens of thousands. Seta Dadoyan speaks of some 3,000 Muslim Armenians in Fatimid Egypt at the time, we're talking 12th, 13th century. The Hamshen, uh, who started converting to Islam in obscure circumstances in the Pontic region around the 15th century, most possibly by coercion, if we can make an educated guess on what we know about Turks and Islam. Theirs is an interesting case, as the Islamicized Hamshens is, at least the eastern portion of them, who live around um, Hopa and um, the city called Makrial uh, near the border with Georgia, 
uh, still speak in decreasing numbers, a variant of Western Armenian with an only unknown number of them, perhaps a minority, being ready to identify themselves as Armenian. But then again, this is a different conversation. And last but not least, closer to our times, Muslims who used to live in the Socialist Soviet Republic of Armenia, who were not all of them of Azeri stock, including Kurds, but who in the wake of the late 1980s conflicts that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union, defected to Azerbaijan, or perhaps it would be more accurate to describe them by uh, as integrating by default into the Azeri society. At the same time, Armenia is the quintessential example of tolerance of minorities, as can be attested in the, in the Republic of Armenia today by the full rights and freedoms enjoyed by Assyrians, the Yazidis and Moluccans, who are more rights in their host country than we have elsewhere. It is important to note here, too, that these processes are not unidirectional. In other words, this does not mean that the aforementioned groups would necessarily have integrated of their own volition into a broader and more diverse Armenian mainstream. Had there been avenues for such absorption, these groups have agency, and it is fair to say that in many cases, if not all, their choices were made with the precise goal of separating from the Armenian people. Then again, we should point out here the Muslim Armenians who gathered in great numbers at the conference in Constantinople in 2013, with many of them willing to be part of the Armenian community, because as it happens, they are segregated both by the Christian Armenians, because they are not Christian anymore, in a country that is still far from being secular, despite all they say about Ataturk and the country he created, or the republic he created. And they are segregated too by the other Muslims because they don't, they, they, they don't really buy that they are really Muslim. Uh, they, are, they call them Dionme, or converted people. Um, yet, you know, even in 2013, after the enthusiasm for such a development faded, it, it didn't take long to realize, at least for me, that the Armenian society does not have any institutional challenges, channels to admit them into the mainstream. A different question is, of course, if we indeed as a nation would want to do that, to integrate Muslims into our society, if we contemplate the possibility that in Turkey alone, including Constantinople and the occupied territories of Western Armenian Cilicia, the numbers of converted Armenians and their descendants may number in the millions. Let me be clear here, we do not know this, and this is extremely complicated to calculate to the point of being a, a moot issue, starting from the definition of, of their own Armenian identity. We would have to you know, split hairs to say who's Armenian, who is not, and that's not the topic of this conversation. And, and, but still, should we admit Muslim Armenians into the communities we have in, in in Wallis, in Constantinople, and the, 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 the small ones elsewhere in Turkey, um, the, the Christian armies would overnight become minority, or could. To wrap up, I would like to briefly reflect on the possibility that we may define ourselves, um, uh, well, well, we may, we may um, somehow prefigure the outcome of our individual and collective actions as a nation by the way we define ourselves. At least two armenologists, Thompson and Von Lind, have remarked on an aspect of Yerish's remarkable history of Bartan and the Armenian War of the 5th century, the Avarail Battle, in which Armenians under the leadership of Bartan Mamigonian are compared with the Maccabees, who considered it better to die a martyr's death on the battlefield than to become apostates. This spirit still survives among some Armenians even today, and not a few, who value dying fighting for one's cause and country rather than living under oppressors, which is summed up in the motto familiar to every Armenian, um, liberty or death. It is fair to point out, however, that this spirit, and even the phrase, is not exclusive to Armenians, and more importantly, that more often than not, the enemies of the Armenians leave us with no other choice. Then again, the point I am trying to make here is that concepts inform the way um, we perceive ourselves and, and our actions. I will first read a phrase by a non-Armenian to illustrate my point. 
It's a bit cross, but I, I hope I may be forgiven for it. And it says, Russia will prove stronger than any nation in Europe. This will come to pass because all great powers in Europe will be destroyed for the simple reason that they will be worn out. There will remain on the continent but one colossus, Russia. Uh, nobody can be blamed here for thinking it was said by Putin, but the author of these words is Dostoevsky almost two centuries ago. Again, what I'm trying to prove here is not passing judgment, but to, to see how striking it is. Um, uh, the enduring power of some national traits. I don't know if this uh, fits into your um, notion of ethnic ontology, but um, it, it, I, I would like to explore that more. Um, and again, the case of uh, pre-Islamic Iran being pretty much the same as it is today, a monistic society that integrates the state and religion. As this year, we celebrate the 850th anniversary of the death of a giant of the Armenian nation and church, Sultan Sessionor Ali. We may also reflect on the expansive and tolerant streak of the Armenian nation that may pave the road to a richer, more diverse understanding of our own sense of nation. Um, if we may describe him in modern terms, Shnor Hali was one of the early precursors of ecumenism and the man of profound humanitarian convictions, which are reflected in his guiding principle to govern relations with fellow Armenians and the world. Which is unity in what matters, freedom in what is secondary, and love in everything. Thank you. This is really a tour de force through uh, Armenian history or histories. There's a lot to discuss about this. I just want to make one point. Um, at some uh, uh, juncture, uh, <coughs> I've just mentioned the notion of uh, <coughs> the fusion of the temporal and spiritual powers. This is, of course, uh, in the whole uh, area of uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, uh, a form which was uh, canonized, as it were, by the Byzantine Empire in the concept of symphonia, of this fusion of the fusion of the temporal and the spiritual powers. They were not inventing it, of course. They were taking it up from Oriental empires. They had done this all along. And in fact, this is the, uh, uh, a very intriguing problem. How can one have uh, um, a, a form of collective identity that is originally and for a long time predicated on the existence of a symphonia, yeah, uh, which Im implicitly means the existence and the uh, predomination of one state. How can one retain that principle of temporal and spiritual powers being in fusion if the state fades away? If uh, there is no state anymore of the nominal ethnic group. And if uh, this symphonia has to be redefined, reinvented in the archipelago of diasporic locations. In other words, uh, having a symphonia, a fusion of the spiritual and the temporal, with the temporal being extraordinarily fragmented, extraordinarily diverse, without any kind of uh, centralized tool, state, that could possibly, you know, temper or tame or uh, regulate the uh, irrepressible diversity that results from history, from the simple <laughs> development of history. This results in extraordinary diversity. Now, uh, there are states that were uh, more bellicose, more uh, brutal, more... Uh, uh, you know, uh, military-centered that were doing assimilation successfully in many places. And this was not started with, uh, like, uh, more uh, uh, recent scholars of nationalism mistakenly believe this was not invented uh, uh, together with a nation-state, but this is a traditional uh, form of, uh, of domination 
through assimilation. And uh, yes, uh, how to deal, uh, how to assimilate as an archipelago, how to be, to offer freedom of choice simultaneously and the uh, magnetic uh, uh, attraction of a deep identity to which people should subscribe. Uh, we have 15 minutes here to discuss. Please make uh, your points, questions, and answers to uh, this here present. Uh, Armenia was Sorry. very homogeneous during the Bolshevik <coughs> period because uh, for the Soviet Union, Armenia didn't raise any problem. If you take into account, for example, the ethnic structure of Baltic states. In Baltic states, it was a, a, a very, a very strong commitment to Russophonite society. Because uh, the uh, centrifug tendency of Baltic states. The same in Moldavia. In Moldavia, there they used to be some Russian roots starting with the beginning of 19th century. But they uh, was, uh, were reinforced because Moldavia uh, has a slave with Romania. Yeah. But because Armenia uh, has uh, neighbors Turkey uh, and uh, Iran, it was uh, <laughs> any, any misconfidence that Armenia could uh, ask uh, the unification of Turkey. And, uh, so this is the main problem, maybe. The homogeneity of uh, Armenia now uh, is due to this uh, geopolitical position of Armenia with uh, such kind of adverse neighborhood, taking into account the faith or the ethnic tradition. And there is another point. Armenia, the current Armenia, is the relic of a wider Armenia, yeah, which was not the, uh, the comparison of Romania doesn't hold because Romania, you know. The second, the second point I want to make. When I visited Iran, yes. the driver who came to, to receive me from the airport spoke a brilliant Armenian. The jardinier in the, in the garden of the church speaks a brilliant Armenian. All of them speak Armenian, spoke Armenian because uh, in the school, in the house, in the family, they were all Armenians because they are completely isolated in a Muslim yeah, world. Eastern Armenian, by the way. In Romania, it is not the case because the border of the community uh, are very. Uh, yeah. so the community are Israel is not the same. So uh, we have this problem of the natural assimilation of the white genocide, uh, which uh, could uh, uh, create a difference between the <coughs> Middle East and Armenian Europe. And the third one, very delicate, the relation between Armenians Hayastansi and Armenians from uh, Kurds. There are some uh, small differences because you know our grandparents, they uh, went out from motherland because uh, they were compelled to do that. Armenians now, they went out from Armenia because they looked for a better life. And if you, if you look, for example, in the communities, with uh, with the uh, uh, historical tradition like Romania and Bulgaria, the Hayastansi, they uh, are a marginal position in the community. Right. <laughs> they are not involved in the ruling uh, elite of the communities. Right. But if you take into account communities like Spain uh, or uh, let's say Poland, the ruling uh, uh, part of the communities are Hayastansi because uh, they are not uh, uh, the root, they are not rooted the Darwinians there. What well, which is my point? There are some differences inside now the Armenians between the origin they provide. Uh, Barska high, Turka high, I don't know, Kransa high, but especially Hayastansi if Armenians for secure. Do you share my opinion? Before you say that, Razmik Panosyan, do you want to interject to come into this or make a different point later? Yes, it's a different point. Okay, then, please. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I was going to, to, to say that maybe Razmik had something to say because he's talking. He will going have, to be he will have but then right. Um, uh, generally, I do. But I think the war of 2020 changed our approaches. I think it, it made us globally a single Armenian community with more things in common. Sadly, it's fear of the Turks, which is fully justified. Um, but I think it holds for the, let's say, for the first part at least, or for the pre-war period, or by pre-war I mean the 2020 war. And um, for, for the most part of the new uh, diaspora from Armenia uh, that came to Europe and elsewhere, Los Angeles, Russia, uh, which is a different case anyway um, in the in the first period but uh, but but uh, but, uh, but I'm more I'm, 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 I'm and I may be mistaken and this is not really my field but what I see is more commonalities now between diaspora Armenian older diaspora Armenians the ones who came from Western Armenia the descendants of survivors of the genocide and the Armenians who come from the homeland I think there is a gradual um, assimilation between both groups, in which, in which I think it's a positive development, if, if that's the case. There may be subtle um, um, there, there may be some marginal resistance between in these groups and, and <laughs> in the way they relate, but I think it's fading now because we mostly share um, our outlook on history and uh, our concerns. We share broadly the common past. Many of the people who came from Armenia are descendants of genocide survivors as well, who ended up in Armenia. They, they, they come from Mush, Van, other places, Sasun. And, um, and I think after this, um, this um, leftover trades that had left living under the Soviet regime have begun to fade, as we see now. Integration between both parts of the Armenian nation in the diaspora is becoming easier, and they are mingling more, um, more, more harmoniously, if I may say so. That's my impression. I, I, I'm not, I live in a very little town, in a, in a little city now in Venice, I only see Surbazar. I, I, I have many friends from both Armenia and the diaspora and friends. And I, I am away from developments in larger communities like Romanian or the ones I, I lived in, um, I was a part of actually, Argentina or, or the US. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not very um, familiarized with what's going on right now in communities in the diaspora. Well, if I may intervene, Sir. Uh, I would love to share your opinion on that, but I can't. All right, so you know better then. I am, uh, that's all I can say. Uh, that's me. Please come here yeah, because we want to see you. Especially in, in, in France and in Switzerland. Right. The, the old Armenian, let's say the old one century, one yes, yes. from 1915. Yes. They simply do not absorb the newcomers. They well, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to hear that that's still happening. We, we leave it at that, and then uh, we we got to a point, and then we, we move to uh, Razvik Panosian, please. Thank you. You didn't mention something crucial that happened in the 18th and 19th century, there is this new thing called nationalism emerging. Yes. And the conceptualization of how politics should be governed or how politics should be done is to this concept of a nation state. Right. right. And so uh, when you're looking at it from a nationalistic perspective, it becomes a lot more difficult to integrate the non-whatever into the uh, 
So that's that's something crucial, I think, that we have to distinguish between the modern period and the right. Period right. 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 The second point uh, that I would like to make is no one says that the states are not important. But if you take the state as the centralizing concept in your approach, your interpretation of an Armenian history would be very, very different. The interpretation of Armenian history would be of identity construction without the state. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So mm -hmm. uh, I will not give it away now. But I think we tend to be a bit too um, preoccupied with this Hegelian notion that the be all and end all of history is the state. And I think those of us who study diaspora would say that mm, states are important, but I really case shows that other things matter to them. They might matter just as much. <coughs> sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in this in this case, the Armenian story is a case in point, basically. Especially in the in the last as a century or so, one can see quite clearly that yeah. The, the absence of a state that, uh, let's say, a regulating centralized state that is uh, ever present and uh, institutionally significant of all sorts, uh, uh, dispensing education, things like that, just didn't, didn't change the, the fate of history. Uh, Osikas Varian, please. You are, uh, no, you, I, I thought you raised your hand. Oh, well, yes, okay. Uh, this is Jakob Matevosian. I can't hear you. Sorry. Okay. Could you please come up here and then make yourself more visible and uh, audible? Okay. Yes. 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 Um, and then you brought up the question of how come one in Armenia? And then um, yeah, the term diaspora, you also brought it into, into discussion. Can we speak about ethnic ontology without adding a diasporic concept? Let me bring, bring an example. I'm studying the Armenians of Hungary. Would it, would it matter you know, how Hungarian are the Armenians in this context? How Romanian is you know, in, in this concept? You know what I mean? Can we, can we add that layer to, the, to your concept and what that, what that mean? Um, the other aspect would be ontological security, you know, the split of us and them. What is the role of us and them in your, your concept? I mean, it's a little bit theoretical, but I'm sure you know. Well, the, this system uh, uh, I devised, ethnic ontology, is theoretical in most ways, but, but uh, it is rooted in the empirical study of essentially Western and Central Eastern European uh, nation states and cultures. My, uh, uh, my interest is in fact to expand it to other areas. I know that I have nothing to do in, uh, in places such as, I don't know, China or uh, India and so forth. I really have nothing to do because there is no uh, 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 relevant uh, uh, elements of commonality that I can identify. And, and, uh, I'm a, a, always Japanese scholars to read Heidegger, but the results are debatable. Uh, so I'm, this is, uh, yes, a kind of, uh, it's not Eurocentric, it's a Euro-specific uh, development. This idea of endowing the nation, ethnic nation, as I said, with a space, a time, a logos uh, of their own. And uh, the thing is, uh, yes, the Hungarians have did wonderfully at it as well in their sweet way. Uh, and this, in fact, if you, if you want to uh, organize this information in another way, it has to do with the very strong current of anti-modernism that is defining Central Eastern European, uh, uh, Central European at the time was also Germany, right? So this is what uh, Central Eastern uh, uh, European cultures from roughly the 1870s, 80s, 80s up to World War II. Uh, Germans cannot study this anymore because the archives are sealed and they cannot read uh, with difficulty. In Leipzig, you can be, uh, get lucky and get to the 
uh, of course, the uh, you know Deutsche Bücherei, the section which is exactly about that period. But you you need to work hard uh, because they have deleted most of these uh, 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 traditions. Uh, well, quite scandalous and uh, whatever you want, even murderous. But they have deleted them. Uh, however, you can identify traces of, uh, and you know, not traces, central uh, uh, cultural trends in each and every one of these states, and they have not died. They are uh, up and running, and in, uh, in, in a way, uh, you have a new generation that is uh, pretty much buying into the same kind of... Uh, this was picked up by the uh, their, uh, right wing in the 1930s, of course. It was not created by them, but uh, used, instrumentalized by them. You could be uh, an anti-modernist, uh, you could be an ethnic ontologist without necessarily becoming a Nazi or a fascist in Italy, very easily. But chance rather uh, strong that you would uh, uh, find allies uh, and uh, some of the allies or the Nazis. Heidegger himself has, is a case in point in the sense that he saw that the artisans of the world he was, uh, you know, uh, fantasizing about, you know, the world of the Dasein, the artisans of that world, the, uh, you know, ridiculously stupid and <laughs> brutal uh, 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 Nazis, whom he despised absolutely, but thought that come, could come in handy for the, you know, the making of the uh, beautiful, perfect world. So yes, yeah, uh, my, uh, at this time, and hence my interest in diasporas, uh, uh, my interest is to see how this is, uh, these ethnic ontologies, uh, you know, are passing the test of, uh, of uh, the diaspora. And what is in fact the, uh, the impact of diasporic uh, uh, histories that affect uh, some of the countries where uh, ethnic ontologists have been. Uh, there's a, a, a small interesting thing to me, anyhow, in the, uh, uh, in the case of Armenia, where you could say that there is an ethnic, religious, ethno-confessional yep. ontology which is closer to the, the truth than because the, the presence of the church uh, and especially of the text the idea that the text acquires, like in the Jewish case, uh, uh, Hebrew Jewish case, acquires a kind of substance of its own. This is uh, uh, absent in most other cases. It is very, very spectacular in the case of Armenian uh, identity. You cannot get around that, that text, whatever, however hard you try, it's there. Uh, you don't. You, uh, you did not adopt the Jewish invention of the tabernacle, of moving, you know, with it and a, bit, a little bit of piece and bits and pieces with which you can reconstitute com the community wherever you go. You you stuck to the text. That the text is enough. The Holy Bible in Armenian seems to be pretty much enough in order to start the fresh wherever you are. So. Uh, any more? If not, then uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Holiness, Your Excellency, my son, have a this. <laughs> we uh, we resume our uh, discussions here tomorrow at 9:30, and we go up to 2 p.m. about it for tomorrow. From 9:30, wake up early to 2 p.m. and then you are free to go.